Did you know that humans can only open their mouths about four or five centimeters wide? That's about three fingers width. Well, most humans anyway. But there's some animals out there that have absolutely enormous gapes. It's usually carnivorous animals or animals with larger canines that can open their mouths up wider than other animals. It's generally accepted that the smaller, less developed masseter muscles of these kinds of animals allow wider gapes because the gape is limited by how much the masseter muscles can stretch. So we often see this trade-off going on between the size of the masseter muscles on one hand and how wide animals can open their mouths on the other. But there's one glaring exception that's a little hard to ignore. That's right, hippos have enormous masseter muscles and enormous gapes. So wait, how is this even possible? Well, in this video, we're gonna take a look at the biomechanics and limitations associated with opening wide, and then we're gonna take a look at how the evolution of the hippo skull took a unique approach to solving the problem. Dr. Rex here. Welcome to the Scullywag Lab, where I present the bare bones fundamentals of skull science. So to answer the question as to how hippos can have enormous masseters on one hand and enormous gapes on the other hand, we need to take a closer look at the underlying theory of gape biomechanics. A lot of this theory comes from the lifetime's work of legendary Professor Emerita Susan Herring. I actually emailed Sue during the preparation of this video to ask her for a rare 1975 paper that she did on a hippo dissection. Then she told me that she actually did this dissection while listening to the Nixon resignation on the radio. That was 50 years ago. <laughs> Just crazy. Anyway, let's get into it. To understand why the positioning of the masseter muscles can affect gape sizes, we need to think about how muscles are limited in their ability to stretch. And it's related to the ratio of these two measurements here, which we'll call the muscle ratio. But it's also related to the angle of these two lines, so really it's a muscle ratio and the angle. Let's call it the muscle rang glacio. And the muscle rang glacio determines another important ratio, called the stretch ratio. And I'm going to show you how all this works. Looking at my beautiful stylized animal skull here, the horizontal line represents the distance from the anterior masseter muscle to the jaw joint, while the more vertical line represents the distance of the deepest part of the masseter muscle to the jaw joint. And these lines sit at an angle of this symbol here. These two lines form a triangle, with the third side of the triangle representing a theoretical maximum of resting muscle length when the jaw is closed. Now notice how when we open the jaw, this extends the length of the muscle between those two points. And it's the ratio of the first and second measurement of the muscle length here that's called the stretch ratio. Now, because the muscle won't actually stretch more than another 30 to 50% of its initial length, animals will shift the proportions of the muscle ratio to allow wider gapes. For example, a horse has almost the same lengths of lines A and B with a fairly acute angle between them. This is really efficient, but it's also the worst rang glacio for opening the mouth wide because it creates the biggest stretch ratio. But when we decrease the height of the mandible and have an angle closer to a right angle as we see in a lot of carnivores, this reduces the stretch ratio, allowing a wider gape before reaching that critical value of 30 to 50% muscle stretch. Now let's take a look at one of the more extreme cases of gapes that we know about, the saber-toothed cat, Smilodon fatalis. Saber-toothed cats of all kinds routinely had extremely shallow jaws, with the jaw joints being super close to the mandibular angles at the bottom. This, coupled with a high range of motion in the jaw joint, means this species could open wide to an estimated 130 degrees or so. So thankfully we don't have saber-tooths around today that are gonna ask for a bite of your sandwich. <laughs> and this brings us back to the hippopotamus. Let's take a look at its skull. Man, I love these skulls. Anyway, you can see that it's clearly a herbivore with a truly enormous masseter and a tiny little temporalis. Now, imagine if this was the skull of another more ordinary herbivore, like a cow or a horse. The angle would probably be about here, in line with the bottom edge of the mandible. But not hippos. They have this huge expansion of the mandibular angle, which allow much bigger masseter muscles, with an insertion area that kind of hooks around here a little bit. This brings that line downwards more. What's interesting about this approach is that it shifts the rang glacio and reduces the stretch ratio of the muscles, but in the exact opposite way to the way carnivores do it. 
and this allows them to stretch open those jaws to an enormous degree. So why don't carnivores tend to use this approach? Well, if you remember in my previous videos, carnivores can't really get away with having a dominant mastodon complex because this force will help pull the jaw out of its socket during those tugging behaviors when securing prey or pulling flesh off the bone and other activities like that. Anyway, the soft tissues around the jaws of hippos are also highly modified to accommodate those wider gapes. That funny grin they appear to have basically comes from folding their lips up when their mouths are closed. Plus, their masseter muscles have quite long fibers at rest, allowing them to stretch more. So we have this whole suite of hard and soft tissue characters in hippos that has likely been selected for through their brutal combat sessions. These can last hours, and deaths are certainly not rare. Dumb skulls. So I realized while making this video that Wikipedia actually says that hippos can open their mouths to almost 180 degrees wide. And I think that's a little bit unrealistic. That'd look a little bit like that old Reach guy from the toothbrush commercials. <laughs> Showing your age a bit there, Rex. <laughs> to get a better idea of how wide a hippo's gape could actually go, I scoured hundreds of photos of hippos yawning and fighting and just showing off their massive gapes. And this one here is about the widest I could find. You can see that while the cranium is essentially vertical, those lower incisors are pretty much facing forwards. So I oriented my 3D skull model to produce the same gape, and then even a little bit more for funsies. So this picture here turned out to have a gape angle of around 125 degrees, and this skull that I set up has a gape angle of around 130 degrees. That would put it on par with a saber-toothed cat, which is really impressive, but I'm not too sure that the jaw can open much wider than that, and that's because the spinal cord just wouldn't be able to withstand opening the jaws much wider. Hippos do have modified joints where the skull meets the spine to be able to handle wider gapes like this, but another 40 to 50 degrees to reach near 180, that'd quite literally be a stretch. And I asked Sue Herring about it as well, and she agrees that near 180 is probably an exaggeration, uh, not least because all of the jaw muscles wouldn't actually have the leverage to close the jaw again. But surprisingly, given how biomechanically bananas hippo skulls are, there doesn't seem to have been a recent dissection done on a hippo head. And I think we're long overdue given the current scanning and digital techniques available, so I'm really looking forward to what comes out in the coming years to shed more light on just how bizarre the skulls of these animals really are. If you've appreciated this content, leave a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.